We have breaking news tonight, as I just mentioned. If your calendar was marked for this coming Monday when President Trump was set to hold a press conference that he would, promised would exonerate him from the allegations laid out in that Fulton County indictment, if that was a date that was reserved on your iCal, well, then I am sorry to inform you that it has been called off. Trump says tonight that his legal team is instead putting all of the overwhelming evidence in formal legal filings. He adds, therefore, the news conference is no longer necessary. And that news comes right after Trump's legal team in another case finally gave its answer as to when they believe the former president should go to trial. Trump's team is arguing tonight that the federal 2020 election case brought by special counsel Jack Smith should go to trial in April of 2026. That is a whopping two years, seven months, and 16 days from now. It notably comes well after the point in which Trump could be back in office and able to pardon himself or just make this case disappear altogether. And his legal team's justification for this date is classically Trumpy. Remember, if you will, when President Trump first took office and had to prove to everyone that he had disentangled himself from his business interests. And he stood next to this giant pile of folders, there they are, and claimed they contained the evidence that he had signed everything over to his sons. Now, Trump refused to let anyone actually look at the contents of those folders, but hey, it was, it was a lot of paper, it was a lot of folders. And today, the argument from his defense team felt a bit like that. In their formal, formal legal filing, the defense included this graph showing the height in feet of all the evidence Jack Smith will turn over to the defense and comparing that height to the Statue of Liberty and the Washington Monument. You'll see the, the discovery evidence is a lot taller than both the Statue of Liberty and the Washington Monument. Trump's counsel compared getting through all that evidence to having to read the entirety of Tolstoy's War and Peace 78 times a day from now until December, which honestly sounds like the homework assignment from hell. And they do have a, a point. It is quite a bit of reading. War and Peace, 78 times a day. That said, we have no idea how much of the evidence provided here will be duplicate information or how much of it includes things that Trump has always had access to, like, for example, the contents of his own Twitter account. Moreover, Typically, it's not just one person doing all that reading. It's why people retain entire legal teams to help them in cases like this. Nonetheless, Trump and his lawyers argue that they will not be ready to go to trial until April of the year 2026, which is a decidedly different date than the one proposed by Jack Smith's team, which would like a trial date set for January 2nd of the year 2024, which is well before the presidential election. Ultimately, both of these dates are just suggestions. The trial date in this case is the judge's decision. And at a hearing last Friday, the judge presiding over this case made it very clear that a key deciding factor here, as far as the date, was going to be how Trump conducted himself outside of the courtroom. This is what she said, quote, even arguably ambiguous statements from parties or their counsel, if they could reasonably interpret it to intimidate witnesses or to prejudice potential jurors, can threaten the process. The more a party makes inflammatory statements about this case, which could taint the jury pool or intimidate potential witnesses, the greater the urgency will be that we proceed to trial quickly. There are a lot of reasons to think that Trump's April of 2026 date is unrealistic, but this, the one outlined by the judge, might be number one. And look at what happened today, for example. Today, Trump and his former attorney general, Bill Barr, had dueling interviews. Trump was on Fox Business, Barr was on Fox News, and both of them were happening at 4 p.m. Remember that Bill Barr announced his resignation as attorney general on the day that the Trump fake electors met all over the country, December 14th, 2020. Trump had asked Barr to use the Department of Justice to do things like name a special counsel to investigate voter fraud and to use the Department of Justice to seize voting machines. So Barr is a potentially key witness here. And Barr has said, as recently as this month, that he will appear as a witness if called to do so. And so in the hours before Trump's and Barr's dueling interviews, Trump posted this online. Why does Fox News constantly put on slow thinking and lethargic Bill Barr, who didn't have the courage to fight election fraud? 
Then after the interview, Trump reposted Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene's claims that Bill Barr is a traitor. Also today, Trump has reposted or posted similar arguably ambiguous threatening things about potential key witnesses, including his former vice president, Mike Pence, as well as Georgia's governor, its former lieutenant governor, and its secretary of state. And also today, again, he posted a bunch of videos like this. How dare low-life prosecutor derange Jack Smith. That's right, he's deranged. Derange Jack Smith and the DOJ. The fake political indictment against me must be immediately withdrawn. The system is rigged and corrupt, very much like the presidential election of 2020, and we have plenty of proof on that. Does that kind of stuff count as a type of arguably ambiguous statements that might be perceived as threats? Barb, let me first start with you and the old, but the documents are taller than the Washington Monument defense. Honestly, have you ever seen an argument similar to this one, complete with a graphic showing how the discovery evidence would, would measure up to the Statue of Liberty? No, and I have not seen a defendant so desperate to delay the trial that they're asking for a date more than two years down the road. It's a really audacious request. Uh, you know, it's not only the defendant that has a right to a speedy trial, it is also the public that has a right to a speedy trial. The public is, has an interest in a uh, reasonably prompt disposition so that a person can either be held accountable or exonerated. And there's also an interest in making sure that witness memories don't fade and that the evidence is still available when the case goes to trial. This argument about there are terabytes of documents here uh, is true in, in not only this case, but in other cases as well. No doubt it will take some time to work through all of this. But no longer is it the world where you sit down with each page and page through it. Uh, the way discovery is reviewed today is it is sorted, it is searchable. Uh, the way you would go about a modern uh, computer search and, and not the way you would read War and Peace at the time it was written. To your point, this evidence will be sort of digested in a way that is not like reading War and Peace. There's also the manpower concern, right? It's not just one lawyer that's going to be tasked with doing that, presumably. But we talked about this last night. Trump does have a weirdly skeletal legal crew assisting him in all of this. I think Todd Blanche, who's representing Trump in three cases, is part of a law firm that has two lawyers. And the question, I think, at some point needs to be posed, when will Trump actually spend the money to hire more lawyers to deal with all this? I mean, that seems like a necessity at this point, does it not? Yeah, I mean, you know, most of the time in a big white collar case like this, you'll retain a firm that has sufficient resources where they can call upon a number of associates or even temporary associates that come on board to do discovery review. And, you know, there'll be a lawyer overseeing all of it, telling them what it is they're looking for. Uh, and then the lawyers review that for, for the kinds of things that they need. So uh, certainly more resources can come to bear than just one lawyer reading each page of the document. And um, I think what's going to happen is first a trial date will get set and then he will retain the lawyers he needs to meet that deadline. When we talk about the trial, whenever it's scheduled, Mark, the reality is that journalists, Americans, other candidates are going to be witnessing the strangest split screen probably in American political history, which is, do we have the calendar? You have the Iowa caucuses on the 15th of January. You have Trump's civil defamation case the same day, Trump's civil fraud case. Two weeks later, the month of March is peppered with caucuses and trials. I mean, this this is the, this is what this is what election season 2024 is going to be. And it truly is like unlike anything we have ever seen in this country. The fact that the presumed front runner is going to be bouncing back, ping ponging between, you know, pressing the flesh in, in Iowa and New Hampshire and Nevada and South Carolina and and going on trial. This seems like the reality that we're barreling towards. Yeah, no, it does make your head explode in some ways. I mean, what. I mean, what I actually am curious about is whether Donald Trump actually welcomes this. I mean, you know, obviously no one wants to be indicted four times and on however many counts. I mean, this is not an enviable position to be in. But when you're someone who's as pathological as Donald Trump is and, and, and feeds on the attention as much as he does, and someone who's been so successful in leveraging attention like this, you know, in some cases very negative attention, into political capital, I mean, you have to wonder, I mean, could he just be so happy that this is—he's going to be 
in the middle of all this. And, you know, yes, it's a split screen, but he'll actually be on both screens. I mean, it's a weird, weird thing. And I wouldn't I, no, it's but it's true. I mean, it's what we're looking at. And, you know, it feels kind of hellish. I mean, certainly it's fascinating, but but it's also, um, you know, you're right. It's unprecedented. So I don't know that I would even use the modifier kind of maybe just kinda, hellish. Yeah. Trying to Barbara, be responsible here. Yeah, I understand. Respect. Yeah. Barbara mm -hmm. McQuaid and Mark Leibovich, thank you guys so much for your time tonight.